Well, I think we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and um, I'll kind of go over the other, the other questions, but uh, we'll make it fairly, fairly informal yeah. and um, we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. So, all right. And I'm Ed, um, Bridget will probably edit this. So what I'll do is I'll just do an introduction and, uh, and then we'll kick it off. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. So, all right. <clears throat> All right, so welcome to all those who've been able to join us today uh, for the podcast. And uh, we've got another great, interesting guest with us today. Um, we've got uh, CV, who is a senior partner, uh, head of Denton's Roderick's corporate practice. And CV is over many areas, including mergers and acquisitions, corporate, corporate reorganizations, investment funds, general corporate commercial matters. And he's advised many general funds. Uh, venture capital funds, founders and startups, everything from small companies to big companies. Um, so, um, CV, thank you so much for joining us today. And Morning. yeah, thanks, Tyler. Yeah. And um, look, I think, you know, the purpose of today's is we, we wanted to get, uh, um, you know, as Denton's is one of Singapore's leading law firms and, and with your team advising on some of the region's most significant M&A transactions, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in the M and in the M and A market right now? Uh, and then, secondly, you know, how has COVID affected the overall deal flow for for the region? Mm, thanks, Tyler. I think what we are seeing is because of COVID, when things slowed down in the first quarter, maybe even second quarter of last year, too much uncertainty. Um, that has sort of changed. To, uh, towards the end of last year where matters started to get going and investors started to look for good investments where they could deploy their funds. Uh, companies wanted to restart their businesses or move on to the next phase. And so, you know, people started talking to each other and deals were being done. So we ended off last year with quite a few deals on the table. This year, we started again. Chinese New Year may have slowed it down a little bit, but now that it's over, it's starting again. In terms of areas, people are looking at logistics, um, you know, platform services, where you have an accumulation of service providers coming and meeting together to provide deliveries or whatever it is. Cloud services, that's been a big thing. Uh, I think generally people okay. are looking at businesses which can overcome the difficulty that people cannot travel and meet each other and how services and products can still be delivered in this you know, new era that we're sort of living in. And anyone that can cause a, a good connection and delivery is in a very, very good position. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a key, <laughs> very, very, very key. In terms of COVID changes, people are trying to find mm -hmm. new ways to, to continue business as usual, yeah. um, even with the restrictions. And, and I think most, most companies and businesses that we've seen, you know, have been able to adopt fairly well, being able to not meet in person and, and deals are continuing to happen. I mean, you and I have worked on several projects and, and I think, you know, with EverEdge, you know, our, our focus has always been on the intangible assets yeah. and, and how they play a role. And I think in this changing environment, those intangible assets, the non-physical assets are becoming even more critical. Um, what are the what are the things that you guys are seeing around the contribution and the role of intangible assets in some of the deals that you're working on or you know are are, are actively advising on right now? Yeah. Um, we're working on a few deals. And what I can explain maybe is this. Because of COVID, where there was a cash crunch and the founders and startups didn't have a lot of money to you know invest in physical assets. So people were cutting back on office space. Mm. Uh, they were cutting back maybe on staff as well. Now, when all that happens, you still need to deliver the service. And then they realized that we can do a lot of things working from home, but you need better software and equipment to help you deliver. And that has a certain intangible asset built into it. Right. And for the very smart entrepreneurs, what they realize is, hey, if I can be in that space, where I am creating the software or something which enables people to work without in that business without having so many physical assets, I'm actually in a good position. Mm, definitely. So, so the intangible assets industry, if I can call that, it be, becomes more important, and people are you know sort of creating software platform solutions which help businesses overcome the lack of the physical aspect 
and being able to deliver their usual business or even connect their own people in the office. Mm. So when you can uh, um, and, you know, work in this space and create something that's really good. From the founder's perspective, what we've seen is the founders realize this and many, many, many founders, you know, this is, I, I don't know if you come across this, Tyler, but when many founders are working on a, on a intangible asset or in a developing their software or their product or application, you know, they invest so much time and effort into it that it's their baby and they don't know how to value it. You know, they're so bought okay. into it. Uh, it's like when you build something, like, oh, this is great. But when somebody says, so what is it worth? You know, and if you don't have that commercial thinking, you're like, I don't know what it's worth, but I built it. It's lovely, you know. <laughs> and I think that's where people like you, you know, come in and you say, well, I'll tell you what I think it's worth and how the rest of the world sees it. You're right. We're always dealing with that that conundrum between the the homegrown sort of company or the startup that's yeah. spreadsheet billionaires and they think they have the next thing since sliced bread and they think their their, their company is worth a billion dollars. And then you go to an investor or a bank and they yeah. say, well, you've got nothing there. And there's yeah. such a discrepancy with sort of the banks looking for fixed assets to lend against and the the founders who think that their, their assets are valuable. And I think they are starting to see the value of those intangible assets. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to actually articulating that value in the sales process, you know, as an advisor on those deals um, from a legal side and from a structure side, yeah. does that come into your advice and guidance? And do you think that, you know, company owners are starting to see more the importance of those intangible assets in the deals that you're, you're doing? Yeah, we do. So I can tell you that when we talk to founders, especially those who have um, the intangible assets, and I and I have a look at their business. I talk to them about. I mean, I don't talk legal stuff at the beginning. I tell them, tell me about your business. I you know I want to be educated what you do and all that, and see how interesting it is. And you know, I, I come from a dinosaur era compared to the current generation. But I said, you know, explain to me. And then when I look at it, I said, well, I can see you got very good IP or very good you know intangible. But how how do you see it? Is that important to you? Because if they tell me, no, no, we, we focus on this, and then I say, well, fine. But I say, if it is important to you, then how are you protecting it? Mm. Right? How are, you, yep. how are you making sure that it's not subject to attack from someone else or someone laying claim that they've done something similar? Is it robust? Uh, and if you're going to take it forward and this is your crown jewel, then you really need to protect it and understand it well. And, and then yeah. that's it. And if, they, and if they see that, then I'm like, oh, if they already tell me that this is important, then I say, great, that's good. Now, how have you protected it? Have you registered? Have you done all these things? Oh, it costs money. I say, well, I tell you what, it does cost money to register intellectual property rights, you know, in the regions you are, but it's money well spent at the beginning. And right. when you I, then, for an investor, sorry, well, I just, when you look at investors when they come in, the investor will say, what have you done to secure your IP? And you can say, I've done all this. Yeah. Right. It's sort of that pre-due diligence steps that those founders need to do uh, so that when the investors come in, they see, see that it's done. And I think from a due diligence standpoint, um, you know, you presented on a, on, a, on a webinar about six months ago around that due diligence topic. What advice would you give to companies or investors um, that are involved in, in transactions uh, around ensuring that they take that proper due diligence um, on, like you said, on their intangibles yeah. or, or, or even on the targets that they're looking to acquire for a JV or an acquisition. Yeah, so I would tell the investors when you're doing your due diligence, the easy part is the physical assets due diligence, mm -hmm. right? That you know title, how long it's been around, depreciation, all those things. But the intangible requires some special attention because if that is what makes the company tick, then you need to make sure that it's protected, that the mm. founders have, first of all, transferred their IP to the company. Mm. Because in some of the earlier companies, you'll find that the founders still holding on to the IP rights. Uh, they have right. registered themselves as the proprietors. Now, that all needs to move into the company. If you're an investor, you want to sit in the company because I'm going to put money in the company. Um, has it been registered? Is it pending registration? Any challenges? You need to just ask all these questions so that you know you know that it's secure. And if it's if it's something that the company or the founder need need help to achieve, 
then in your negotiation, you can say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll put money in and I want some of this money to go towards securing the registration or protection of the IP. Yeah, so they sort of pre-market saying, well, we'll give money as long as it goes towards this or that, the yes. protection. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good advice, especially no, not just from a deal structuring, but from a legal advice to protect them in both sides of it. So, I, yeah. So there's, look, I mean, there's been a lot of, um, I guess, uncertainty in the markets over the past 12 months. The impact of COVID has been felt globally. And what do companies preparing for, for like your startup companies, what do smaller companies that are looking to do a capital event or looking to, you know, raise capital initially, what should they be thinking about as we look forward to the next, you know, 12 months as, as you help companies? is on that early stage. Um, I guess my questions are, what advice would you give to a new startup? And at what point should they engage a firm like yours? Mm. So for new startup, I think importantly, get your house in order. So you may have spent a lot of time developing your app or your software, whatever it is, your IP. But when you want to talk to investors, you need to prepare, prepare your slide deck, be very sure what you want money for. Quite often, mm -hmm. uh, I see founders getting together, they're all excited and then they realize they need more money, right? They take money from family and their friends and their own savings. Fine. For the next stage, the bigger next step, you need to be a little bit more professional in how you go and talk to investors. So get your act together and be very clear why you want the money. It's, it's fine to tell the world and the investors, this is what my app does. I can do this. I can, you know, make pigs fly and all the kind of things. But what do I need the money for? And is my intellectual property or my intangible asset secure and does it belong to me? If it's a licensed software, fair enough, is that secure and all that? And once they have that together, I always tell them, please don't try to value your company at that stage. Mm. I find one, maybe it's, a, I don't know whether it's an error or whether it's just part of the whole thing where you feel so excited. You say, well, I think all this is worth, my company is now worth $10 million. I tell them, don't start off like that. Go and try and excite the investor first. And if the investor engages with you and wants to do more, then you talk about, you know, how much you value your company later on. And, and my second question is, when should they engage a company like yours? Because the reason I ask this is because, you know, I've worked on deals where we've seen that had they gotten an advisor in, I think most people think, well, we bring in a lawyer or a law firm at the end. And I don't think they understand that, that Denton's is also, you know, it, it is a strategic advisory firm as well that can help structure deals the right way at the beginning. Yeah. And, um, you, know, you know, personally, some deals that I've point. seen. Yeah, it's a fair point, Tyler. And I tell you why. I mean, I understand that many startups for them, it's a question of, I've got limited funds. How do I deploy it? Mm-hmm. And if I bring a law firm like Denton's in, I, I might not be able to afford them. You know, can I pay the fees? I understand all that. And what we've tried to do at our firm for, for many years we've been in this is that we try to be start this journey with the founders as early as possible. Uh, I've had discussions with founders, even at an early stage where the, you know, three or two or three of them are getting together. And I say, guys, have you got your act together? Meaning, how are the three or two of you going to get move things together when you get bigger? All right. Don't talk about investors coming in. Just the two or three of you sorting out your own issues. Mm -hmm. And we start that journey. And, and everybody's very clear. And they know that, okay, CV is telling us all the bad things now so that we are prepared for it. And when we do that, we tell them our fees at the beginning can be at a discounted rate. That's not a problem. But we just want to engage with you. And then when you do your fundraising, okay, fine. Then you can pay us the fees and then we're okay to wait for some time for fees. But get us in early. So I will be very honest with the founders and tell them these are all the legal issues you face in terms of your own relationship, your assets, uh, how you manage your staff. And then when investors come in, what they'll probably be asking for and are you prepared to give this or give that or not? You know, and you need to know where to stand your ground and where you can afford to yield a bit and be compromising. Yeah, I think they, I think a lot of founders don't realize the, the expense of doing it wrong two or three times, right? <laughs> As opposed to getting the right advice 
good advice and early up front, right? Yeah. I mean, there are founders who come to us when they're doing their series A, they would have done seeds. And then I realized they've sort of locked themselves into certain term sheets yep. that the investors would have taken. And, you know, I wouldn't say taken advantage, but just that commercially, they weren't able to negotiate better terms. And it yeah. makes it harder for the next rounds because any investor coming later will say, well, I want what the first investor had plus more. <laughs> right? So... Yeah. I, well, look, uh, very, very good advice, both for startups and mid-tier companies that are in that stage. Um, you know, and, and, and CV, thank you so much for, for you know, going through these, these, th this time with us and giving your wisdom. It's always good to talk with industry leading professionals as yourself. Um, you know, getting a partner from one of the largest law firms in Asia is, is, is always a pleasure to sit down and speak with you. Um, look, I'll, I'll wrap this up. I'll wrap this up with one last question for you. You know, what, what advice would you give our listeners as your sort of piece of life or as a, as a piece of life business or advice to live by? What, what would that be from you? I mean, I would tell, and I presume our listeners would be either the founders, I focus on the founders these days. When you are working on something, you have to be focused. You have to know the value of what you're doing. But you also need to know that if you're going to invite third parties to come in and invest and share their dream with you that they might you have to know when to set, sometimes accommodate mm. different views which you may not agree with but they obviously are sharing that view with you to try and improve your overall approach right so you cannot be so stubborn and steadfast in whatever you believe and think this is the only way to do it you are inviting investors strategic partners to come in to help you, not just to take their money. They're not going to give you money and say thanks. That's it. That's not the way this world works. So learn how to accommodate, how to take the benefit of what your investors and third parties and advisors may want to share with you, so that you then see a much broader picture. And I mm. think that sets you on a good path going forward. Great. Well, CV, thank you so much. I think that is excellent advice, and I think anyone who is looking for that strategic advice needs the um, you know, advisory firm on their side, you know, contact CV, get out there early, make sure that you get your deal structured correctly so that you can raise capital. You don't get yourself into a, a, a bad situation early on that's harder to fix. Um, and uh, so thank you so much again for your time today. And um, uh, you have a great week. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, CV.